Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Cheryl Richards, and I have the pleasure of serving as the CEO and Regional Dean of Northeastern University here. Um, how many of you knew Northeastern University was here in Charlotte before you got this invitation? So handfuls. Um, this uh, month, actually last month, actually marks our one-year anniversary of being in Charlotte. Uh, Boston-based university for over 115 years, one of which we have a distinguished alum here in the audience and another alum in the back um, from Boston. <laughs> And uh, the university made a decision um, about two years ago to come to Charlotte because Charlotte was a thriving city that had a lot of new opportunity, new industries that were diversifying and didn't necessarily have graduate programs that would support those industries. So this is a purely graduate campus, master's degrees only. Right now we have eight programs, um, MBA, finance and taxation, which are all online. And then we have programs that are hybrid where students alternate time in the virtual space and then time on campus in programs like project management, leadership, sports leadership, um, education, and health informatics. And uh, we hope by this time next year, our portfolio will be about 20 degree programs that will also include doctoral programs. So if you're representing companies that have interest for employees going back to school, we'd love to talk to you. More importantly, um, the signature of Northeastern is our experiential learning model. And it's really why we decided to bring this format here in this program to the campus today. Um, we've always believed that um, education should never be limited to a classroom and that it should never be limited to students and one professor. And so we do that in our signature co-op programs on 92 countries now where we send students out for six months at a time to live and work in an environment and then come back and apply their learnings. And then oftentimes we um, take topics of interest out on the road and bring them relevant to the communities that we're in. And hence was born the Local Leaders Global Impact Series. So this is the third in our six or seven series for the fiscal or for the calendar year for us. Um, we started off in September with a series on transit with Governor Dukakis, who is on our faculty, and Carolyn Flowers, who is the CEO of CATS. Um, last month we did one on innovation and entrepreneurship with Dave Jones of Peak 10. Many of you know Peak 10 here locally, and one of our faculty members out of the DeMore McKim School of Business, who runs an uh, accelerator, Idea Venture Center. And then we started talking about what are the, the next topics that we start hearing that are um, coming of interest. And small business, we know, is um, the backbone of our economy. And we also know that there are a lot of challenges for small businesses, and even more challenges for family-owned businesses. And a lot of times um, we don't address them from the, the topics outside of capital and how do you get access to capital. So we thought we would bring in um, one of our local leaders and one of our global experts. Let me introduce Ron Norelli, who you may know is the CEO of Norelli and & Company and an alum from our MBA program. I won't embarrass him by saying what year um, there. Um, Ron has been a great champion and supporter of the university coming uh, to Charlotte, and for that we are very deeply grateful to you. Thank you. Um, and uh, as you may know, has served on the Family Firm Institute and so has a great perspective around family business and small business. Dr. Kimberly Edelston is one of our associate uh, professors in the DeMore McKim College School of Business. Now, we just changed the name, $60 million gift, we'll change a name. Yeah. Um, it's a good thing to have. You might have a visa. <laughs> and uh, Kimberly is also the associate editor of the uh, Journal of Family Business Strategy, and so um, has quite a broad perspective on the topic that we wanted to explore today. So I know many of you are working in small businesses or you are providing services services to those um, as well. And so I'm going to stop there, turn it over to our moderator, Eric Spanberg from the Charlotte Business Journal. Thank you as well for doing this and let you take the uh, conversation from here. Very good. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I do note that uh, we never grow up, do we? Nobody sits in the front. It's just like school. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, before we get to our experts, um, I just wanted to mention, I'm sure all of you know it because you care about small business, but uh, according to the Small Business Administration, small businesses accounted for 64% of the new jobs between 1993 and 2011. Uh, we hear this number on television a lot um, and everywhere else because small business drives the economy and 
some of you may have noticed the economy had a few hiccups here in recent years. Um, so these companies matter very much, not just in terms of you having a goal to start one, but in terms of our overall economic health. Um, and there was a story in Time Magazine this year that talked about how both small and large companies in terms of startups uh, really drive job creation. So again, this is such a key issue for our economy uh, in Charlotte and across the nation. So we're lucky to have these two experts with us. Um, and I guess we will start talking a little bit about uh, both small business and family business. Um, and if you don't mind, uh, Ron, I'm sorry, Kim, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the distinction is there between those two? Um, well, family businesses, sometimes they're thought of as mom and pop shops, and they're not, not necessarily. A family business can certainly be a small business, but they also represent about 35% of the Fortune 500 companies. 60% of all public companies in the U.S. are considered family firms. When we look at large companies, generally we're going to define a family business as one where 5 to 20% of the shares are held by one family. And then we'll look at things like involvement. Is the family on the board? Is the family member CEO? And then for small businesses, particularly an entrepreneurial business, we'll look at is the family active? Are they employees? And then is there an intention? to pass the business on to the next generation. And Ron, you, you deal a lot with family-owned business, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, one of the issues that I think uh, you were talking about before we started is this notion of succession, uh, and also just how a family adjusts as a business grows and evolves. Uh, can you give us a little flavor of what kinds of things you're typically dealing with there? Is there a typical thing that you deal with? In that regard. Eric, I often say I've seen a lot, but I would never say I've seen everything. <laughs> um, most of the time, uh, succession issues are left to too long. Uh, I've seen situations where um, there has been no succession planning until there's a crisis, a health crisis usually. And that usually, uh, often uh, threatens the business threatens the family dynamic, um, and um, oftentimes the, either the, the founder and patriarch or the second generation don't ever want to believe that anything will happen to them. But uh, I'm involved with, with a family business this year, a Midwestern business uh, headquartered, 54 years old, and right in the midst of a transition between a second and third generation. Um, and that transition uh, has been pretty well managed. I mean, they, they've managed to get along. There's a large number of family members involved in the business. They've had a stockholders agreement for a long time. They have a, a board of directors, but it's not, it has no outside members. Uh, and they have a lot of uh, things on their plate and it's, it's a stressful time for them to be figuring out how to move forward while there's a transition going on in, in um, generation where some second generation people want to retire uh, and third generation people are, are moving into uh, management positions. The business from a strategic standpoint has a tremendous amount of change facing, facing it as well as major opportunities and the, the, a, a critical strategic issue they're having to face is that without changes being made in the how they do things, they will not be able to proceed with what they want to do uh, and still maintain the financial and shareholder uh, policies that they've always had. And in, in a strategic sense, they're if the, without, without changing some things, they will be piling a tremendous amount of strategic risk on top of financial risk, and that's a bad place to be. Now, Kim, uh, you deal, deal with uh, small business more than family business, correct? No, I'm actually known for family business. Oh, I'm sorry, you deal with family business more than small business. <laughs> I, I, I got to Actually, both, complaining. though. I do both. So tell me a little bit about what you're seeing, since you're maybe a little broader perspective than just Charlotte, obviously. What kinds of things are you seeing in terms of these businesses dealing with all the challenges that are out there right now? Well, I can actually add a little bit to what Ron was saying. Um, one study found that 
only 40% of family businesses have a succession plan. And with all the baby boomers getting ready to retire, in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see a huge challenge for these businesses to have in place some kind of succession. And you know, you ask why don't they do it? You know, with you know, your heart, your heart versus your mind. I guess no one wants to plan their funeral, and that's what you're asking these entrepreneurs to do. Especially, the, it's always the founder. Am I right? The founder who started the business, it's his, her baby. And when you're asking that person to think about, well, who can fill your shoes? No one can. And then a child's always a child, so it's difficult. And like, part of it is, you know. Sometimes when we work with them, we think, well, what if, what if a crisis happened? And you can kind of try and baby step it with a short term kind of a plan and then long term. But, it, you know, I mean, I even have my husband's a family business owner. And if God forbid something happened to him tomorrow, there is no plan. <laughs> my father is a lawyer. He has a small law firm. He does wealth management. He's a business lawyer. I've given him books on family business. I've invited him to our Center for Family Business. I won't even repeat what he says <laughs> because he's never going to die. And, you know, knock on wood, he won't or whatever that is. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's, it's so hard. No one wants to plan their funeral. So it's, but it's going to be a major issue with the baby boomers getting ready to retire. And then what we're seeing, I don't know if you're seeing this, Ron, too, is uh, if they wait too long, the second generation might leave, or whatever that next mm -hmm. generation is, they get fed up of waiting. And then we're also seeing some firms where they're skipping a generation. Are you seeing this where, you know, dad never, I'll say dad, you know, dad never left, and now the second generation is actually thinking about retirement. Wow. And, and so it's, you know, it's a, a big, big issue. So you're both working with the Carolina Panthers right now, I think is what you're... Uh, <laughs> uh, how is part of that beyond not wanting to plan your funeral, which is not the most thrilling thing to do, uh, maybe on a rainy day, but is part of it, though, that when you're dealing with a small business, inherently you don't have as many people, uh, and you have all these other challenges going on, and so you get distracted by the day-to-day, -day and you can't focus on the long term? That's a great question. Um, I often talk about the three deadly Ds of strategic development denial, distraction, and delay. And, um, and it doesn't have to be a family business for this to happen, but um, there is such a thing as a good strategy versus a bad strategy. Um, there's usually no one strategy that I would say is good to the exclusion of all others. There, there are often many alternatives, or several alternatives, each of which has their own pros and cons, and you can you can assess which the, the risks and rewards of going in various directions. But there's also such thing as a bad strategy, one that is doomed to fail from the beginning. And if you want to get sarcastic about it, even the better you are at executing it, the faster you'll get into more trouble. Um, and somebody needs to know the difference of those. And, and, and a small business, whether it's family or not, um, often thinks about strategy and, and gets over, over excited. They underestimate the challenges. They often don't have the right people in the right jobs to be able to make the strategy succeed. And so they, they can proceed down a path of, uh, because of naivete or improper analysis or not ex assuming that competitors, whoever they are, are going to lie or are gonna stand around and watch them take their business away. Yeah. <laughs> and for all those kinds of reasons, um, get in trouble and it's always hard to fix the trouble you know when you when you've when you've had a you've di dissipated some of the energy of the organization by by wasted energy uh, you've uh, you've wasted time because the world doesn't stand still and that's more true than now than ever I mean the, the pace of technological change whether it's digital whether it's uh, materials technologies whether it's globalization whether it's regulation there's so many things going on all the time that when a small business or, or a family business uh, checks the box on their menu, do we have a strategic plan, they fall into the trap often of checking that box and thinking their job is done. And it's not. It's a lot easier to put a plan on paper than it is to execute it. And, um, and even when it's a good plan, four months from now it might not be a good plan anymore. 
uh, and the changes that happen to a business that are, that, that are happening all the time, whether they know it or not, the kind of change that is imposed upon a business by default is rarely good. Ron, you just hit on something very important. Um, there's this misperception that strategy is uh, directly related to performance, and all our research actually shows it's not significantly related because what a lot of entrepreneurs and family businesses do is they create a strategy and they check off a box, I have it. And they forget that a good strategy also evolves. And so what we're finding is that it's really about the process of strategic planning. And now we're finding more than ever, it's those businesses that they allow room for flexibility and adaptation. The technical word we use is effectuation in the research. But really, you know, that a strategy, it's not a one-time deal. And we see it with family businesses when the second and third generation get a hold of the business and they think they can still follow the strategies of their dad. Uh, you know what I mean? And some of it is, you know, almost like a family allegiance. But with change happening so rapidly and product life cycles, um, you know, quickening and customer demand being so intense, it's so important that, you know, that they always constantly reframe their strategies. And so you can't just have one, you have to constantly work at it. It can't just be the check off the box like you just mentioned. And, and in, in case of family businesses, a lot of what I've been exposed to in the years that I've been involved with the Family Firm Institute is that they'll have the, the family, uh, family business advisor who will say, here's the things that a good family business has to have. And there's a menu. And one of those boxes is to check off the box. And when I presented at the latest FFI conference in Brussels a couple of months ago, um, I asked people, uh, who were in my who came in my audience? They said, um, "I said, how many of you uh, advise your family business clients to check a, to have a strategy, strategic plan?" Everybody says yes. Well, I said, "How many of you believe that your family business clients, when they check the box, they assume I've done that, and all strategic plans are created equal?" And they start laughing. They said, "Yeah, all the time." I said, how many of you have been in a situation where it has turned south and then you have to do something about it? And they would all say the same thing. And I said, um, what we're going to talk about today in that talk was that what's the difference between a good plan and a bad plan? And how do you know when one is perhaps doomed to fail right out of the box? But then how do you, how do you adjust and how do you cre create a, an organization and a culture that is able to sense change in a proactive way and realize when something is happening or th something is about to happen that's not going the way you think it's going to go or better yet where you um, where you anticipate change and you you create the change on your own I would ask them uh, how many of you think your uh, how many of your family business clients are willing to be their own cannibal meaning uh, um, preempt the competition by cannibalizing your own product. This is the Steve Jobs theory of iPhone takes the iPod. And willing to be their own cannibal versus falling to the cancerous trap of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. And that is a cancer, in today's world anyway. <clears throat> um, Kim, I'm curious, you know, as you see this play out over and over again, do these businesses inherently need outside counsel? Is it almost impossible to be self-aware enough to have this evolving long-term strategy? Um, well, I think the really smart entrepreneurs always have their finger on the pulse of their customers. And they're they're constantly doing their own research. So, yeah, I think consulting is great. <laughs> but I think, I'm not going to say I wasn't not, trying to lobby yeah, to consult this part right now. It's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> but, um, well, no, the reason I was really asking is because both, both of you are kind of saying that this is something that a lot of people dread or feel like they can do once and it's checked off. Well, no, if they, you know, I mean, hopefully, uh, the thing, the problem is, too, a lot of entrepreneurs don't have a business education. And, of course, when you're running a business, 
you're running a business. There's a business behind it. So um, part of what they can do, though, is it's amazing how, you know, what is it, less than 30% of entrepreneurs have any idea what their competitors are doing. Any idea. Um, it's amazing. That's not good, I'm guessing. No, I, I just, you know, I mean, we'll look at the example of how Netflix damaged Blockbuster and how, what was the other example I gave, um, how Polaroid was absolutely overtaken by digital media. And everyone knew they were working on this technology, but they just ignored it. And even the BlackBerry and what happened with the iPhone. Everyone knew Steve Jobs was working on an iPhone, and the BlackBerry just kind of let them come right in. So a lot of entrepreneurs, the smart ones, have a vision, they have an identity, and they have a mission. And that is so important because sometimes they get so overwhelmed and they chase sales that they don't realize that some sales aren't making them any money mm -hmm. and all, so, sometimes they lose who they are which means they sometimes learn lose their unique selling proposition so it's really important even when they're evaluating strategies they they don't try and be something fake or what they're not so it starts with the mission and really knowing what they're good at what's your core competency what do customers love about you and then constantly you know I mean looking at your customers and sometimes entrepreneurs they lose touch as they grow they have less contact with customers they don't talk to their employees or whoever is whoever has contact with your customers they know they know if there's a kink in the system they know what annoys you're all consumers you know when there's something that goes wrong and the entrepreneurs they lose touch with it sometimes when they grow so the smart entrepreneurs constantly are in touch with Customers, employees, even suppliers. Suppliers can tell you. They look at their competitors. And another thing is ratio analyses. It's not sexy. But when you apply for a loan or you get a consultant, the first thing you do is you do ratio analyses. What's making you money? What's losing you money? You know what I mean? 27% of all entrepreneurs do this. And then the Pareto's law, simply understanding something simple like this, the 20-80 rule. 20% 20 of your customers account for 80% of your profits, and they also use it with products sometimes. 20% of your products or services generally account for 80% of your sales. And so that means you constantly have to be digging into your numbers, understanding what's selling, and it changes over time. What made you money 10 years ago might not be making you money now. So they're constantly learning, and that's what, you know, I know I always talk to entrepreneurs I'm working with. They're, they're constantly learning and searching and trying to become experts of consumer behavior. And then entrepreneurs, sometimes their ego gets in the way. And it, that's when those are the most dangerous because, of course, it takes incredible confidence and risk-taking to launch your business. It's, it's amazing. And you've got to have a thick skin. But at the same time, you've got to be willing to listen and see the signs. And then if you need help, and those, a lot of entrepreneurs aren't willing to ask for help. Mm -hmm. But if you need help, you've got to be willing to face it and go get whatever help you need. And there's so many, I'm always amazed how many entrepreneurs don't know about the resources they have. Different universities have centers, you know, there's FFI, there's the SBA, and they don't even know about it. They don't look, and yet they're struggling. So, uh, Cheryl mentioned at the beginning uh, access to capital. That always comes up when we talk about small business. But uh, beyond capital, which obviously we need money to start businesses. Um, I'm curious though, what's harder now and what's easier now if you're an entrepreneur? Uh, because I think people just tend to fixate on the money, which is very important, but there are so many other aspects getting into your own business. What's harder now? Well, the, the pace of change is harder. Okay. And there's no sign that that's, uh, that, that's going to slow down, it's accelerating. Um, the availability of really good talent is harder. In fact, Lloyd's of London uh, last year had a, um, a study that said the new currency is talent and that um, and prior to that the Economist magazine a couple of years ago talked about the global shortage of really good talent that can differentiate a, a business rather than take it down a commodity path and so the the, the pace of change accelerating, the business models changing, the old very famous and very, very valuable and continued to be valuable Porter's Five Forces 
is no longer five forces, it's eight. <laughs> with digitization, globalization, and regulation. And um, <clears throat> having the right people in the right place is harder. Um, and I'm not sure anything is easier. <laughs> Uh, well, let me go to a family. Let's go to family businesses. What are what what things help a family business that might not be as um, prevalent or even there in a small business that's not that doesn't have the family business characteristics? First of all, a really great family business that can beat the statistics and can be a third or fourth generation that's 50 years old. Even, that doesn't mean they've been successful for 50 years. It means they've been able to weather the storms and somehow come through the storms that are there. It all goes back, in my experience, to a very, very strong core value system. The core values are known. They're, they're passionate about them. They don't deviate from them. And if someone can't follow them and commit to those values, they're just in the wrong place. They shouldn't be working here. And uh, they, that tends to coalesce people during stressful times. It also tends to make a family business, at the risk of overgeneralization, be more long-term oriented than the next quarter or the next six months. Uh, they're less likely to cut out R&D or cut out marketing uh, and turn the spigot on and off, uh, they're less likely to cut back on key talent because they, they realize there's an opportunity cost there and uh, the cutbacks and, uh, and, and, and um, going for the short term statistically mo more often than not doesn't work anyway. Um, and uh, and they, if they're a great family business, they not only work harder than anybody else, the employees would walk through a wall for them. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have that in a family business, it will take somebody like Kim or myself maybe a half hour to find that out. Because <laughs> um, there, are, there are telltale signs, uh, physical and otherwise, that you can spot. Why, why don't you mention some of the, your white glove test, both of you, I'd love to hear. You know, what, what are the tells when you, when you walk into a business? I'm gonna, one of my or... favorites that I, that I will use, and I even used it in that talk I made, because I've, I've only seen this once in my life. This was a third generation family business. It is still in existence. It is, it is doing well. The family is not running the business anymore. They brought in outside people, non-family members. Um, but the first, and they had a very good outside board. Someone mentioned advisors. This particular company, was a third generation. It spanned eight states uh, from the mid-Atlantic to Georgia. Um, and they were having some mild signs of atrophy. They had outside directors, including one prominent pro partner of a CPA firm and another prominent lawyer, and they listened to them. Well, I was, they, I was referred to them, and I walked in, I went to the corporate office um, for the first time and was waiting to, to see the chairman. And I remembered uh, there was a scene that I've only seen, it's the only time I ever saw this scene, either never seen it before and have never seen it since. It was a very non-ostentatious uh, waiting room, tasteful but, but not garish, conservative. And I noticed on the coffee table um, six issues of the Harvard Business Review all lined up in a row in, in chronological order. I couldn't tell whether any of them had been opened. <laughs> I said, well, that tells me something. Um, I looked to the left to a coffee table and I was taken back by what I saw. It was another document, a book, probably the most printed book in, in history. Anyone want to guess what it was? A Bible. And I said, well, that's interesting. I've seen Harvard Business Reviews or Sloan Management Reviews or Journal of Families Business Reviews in many clients before. And I've seen Bibles in, in office, corporate offices before, but I'd never seen them both in the same room. 
And I thought to myself, what does that tell me? And I learned what it told me when I interviewed 50 or 60 of their employees over the next three or four months. But you, you pick up signs like that. Another telltale sign that would bother uh, anybody who is having under financial stress, whether it's a family business or not, is reserve parking places. Um, Doug Anderson's here. You, you reminded me of a, of, a, of a company in another city that one of my key people was an was a uh, interim CEO of. And uh, they had banking pressures. They were, you know, they, the lender was not their friend. And, uh, and uh, they were in a, under a forbearance agreement and all the things that that entails. And the banks were coming out for a visit. And John told the family members who didn't really want the banks to come, get those cars out, in the, out of the reserve parking places and out in the, in, in, in the employee parking lot. That's just an example. Um, closed doors uh, when you walk around the hallways. That's a sign. And then there was a famous professor in the Sloan School at MIT when I worked there who uh, was in the original In Search of Excellence book. His name was even mentioned. He's now a professor emeritus. And he tracked the frequency of communication in technically oriented businesses, the kinds that would have guys, guys or women in the Sloan School. How, frequent did they, how frequently did they speak to each other? And he, this is going to sound nerdy, and it is, but he determined that um, for every 90 feet between people's offices, the frequency of communication over a course of a year exponentially decreased by two-thirds for every 90 feet between the offices. And that's when they were on the same hallway. If they had to turn a corner, you're on a different decay rate, and heaven forbid if you had to go upstairs or outside. And that was before the internet. You know, it's, it can be worse now because email can be an excuse to not communicate. It's a CYA, just as, and, and there are times when you have to get in front of somebody. You can't, even today, uh, and all those little telltale signs uh, are um, things that are a, a hint that something might not be right. But the value system, and when you see that the people who are in the highest positions and have them, uh, they work harder than anybody else. I had a sixth generation family business where in the conference room they had oil portraits of the sixth generation and the father and the son, the fifth and the sixth who were still there were always the first ones in in the morning and the last ones to leave at night.